John Carrico, and uh, today's date is January the 21st, 2020. I got the year right, I'm so proud. And interviewing Keith Babcock, who in World War II was a crew member and a nose gunner on a B-24 Liberator. And he's going to tell you about his experience. Um, and just for a second here, if I would, I'm guessing this is probably this could be kind of an emotional thing for you, and I hope it's not. It could so, be. Um, um, you know, I, if and I can always stop the camera, it's not a big deal. So, where were you born? Toledo, Ohio. And when? 1924. Okay, so uh, where would you go to high school? Devilbus High in Toledo. World War II started the Americans in 19. Well. 1941, end of 1941. Uh, where were you when the war started? I was uh, in, let's see, it, went, it started in 41. I was still in high school. Okay. And when did you graduate? 42. When did you, when did you enter the Army Air Corps? Well, I was drafted at age 18, had no skills, one semester of college. They sent me to uh, infantry basic training in Florida, and then uh, went on to, uh, into doing um, field stuff in just Arkansas, out. just outside of Little Rock. You think, yeah. Yep. yeah. So just outside of Little Rock, what base was that? Uh, Camp Robinson it was called then. They're still there. Oh, really? Uh, I think they have, uh, you know, just, I don't know. I shouldn't say. I'm yeah. not sure. I know it's still used some. Yeah. So the, the, uh, now, did you pick aviation or did they pick it for you? Okay. I was on Little Rock on a leave one day or a weekend. I saw a sign that said transfer from your present outfit into Army Corps, Air Corps cadet program, which is what I'd always wanted to do. And I filled out everything. I had to give them all kinds of stuff, things from my teachers in high school and my minister and so on. And finally they called me and my uh, CO called me, infantry CO called me. He was really mad. He said, I got orders to transfer you to Keyser Field, Mississippi for Air Corps cadet training. I'd already sent your name to go to Benning for OCS. Thank you, sir. I'm going to take my chances in the Army Air Corps. And he couldn't stop me. So I did go to Keesler, and there were probably a thousand of us waiting for assignment. And they kept taking people and taking people. And finally they said, well, we got enough navigators, pilots, bombardiers. You're all going to go to gunnery school. That meant aerial gunnery school. So that's what I did at Tyndall Field, Florida. Well, that, that's a surprise to me. So, and you're at basic and they say, okay, you guys are going to be officers, pilots, co-pilots, or navigators, but the rest of you guys are going to be enlisted guys. But it, it, was, it was that random? No, nobody had said I was going to do any of those three things. As I said, uh, when I had a chance to transfer from infantry arm, in the Army Air Corps, they just said, we're going to send you to Keyser Field, and there'll be a large pool of men there trying to get those jobs. And uh, if you don't get it, why well, we're not sure what you're going to do, but uh, you'll fly. So that's what happened. Uh, so with now, me. What, what date would this be? I think beginning of '44, or the end of, you know, probably beginning of very beginning of '44, January maybe. Okay, so then where did you go for gunnery training? Uh, where did I go? I went to Tyndall Field, Florida, Florida, which is still in business, yeah, yeah. and uh, took my gunnery school there. They what did they, what did they, okay, now you had basic training, so and you were so basically told you're going to go to gunnery school because the jobs were taken for other crew positions. What did they? What did they? Tra first, how long was the gunnery training? As I recall. It was about six weeks. And what kind of training? What did they do? Well, we did a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that we did, which I liked, to, to show us how to lead a, a plane, uh, we used shotguns. And they'd put skeet up in the air. Oh, cool. I loved that, because oh, I'd done right. that before. 
And then uh, they had us on moving trucks, going, skeet going by, to teach us to really lead again very well. So you're uh, in a truck going 20 miles an hour or whatever? Not and, very fast. And no. so it, the idea is to get the relative motion idea. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, so what the, I had the, to So the skeet were, okay, so you're on a truck, and were the skeet coming from another truck in front of you? No, there's, an, yes, another truck going kind of parallel, and it would shoot up the skeet. Now the other skeet went up from a stationary object up into the sky. Wow, wow. That's the way I remember it. Yeah, yeah. I bet that was kind of fun. And a few, it was a lot of fun, yeah. How, were you really good at it, or? Uh, pretty good, because I'd already done a little skeet shooting. Oh, okay. Yeah. One thing I find with the fighter pilots who became aces, so many of them were like farm boys. They were used to shooting at things, you know, or hunters. Mm -hmm. you know, Which I was. Yeah, I, was a, there you go. I was a hunter. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so now, how did you get selected to be in the nose of the airplane? Do you mind if I go back a little bit? Please. I just wanted to tell you that, that uh, now I had it in my mind, just a minute. Oh, one thing I had to do which really scared me, because I'm not mechanical. I had to take apart a Browning 50, 50 caliber machine gun and put it back together blindfolded. Wow. They let me look at it first and play with all the different parts and, to, and tell, eat, learn what each part was of the Browning. And then, uh, as I say, I had to be blindfolded and put it back together, and I was really sweating, but I made it, so <laughs> then I was able to go on. So now the, so you had, the airplane had 13, 14 guns on it, something like that, didn't it? I've never counted them. I would guess 12, but I'm not sure. I mean, I can tell you where they were if you, you want. You had two in front, yeah. two on each side, two in the back, mm -hmm. two in the turret to drop down. Oh, turret. And I think, didn't a navigator or flight engineer have guns on top as well? No, but we had a uh, top top one, top gun, which you didn't mention. Now, is it is it a, was it a G model that you were flying? Oh, heavens. I flew a lot of different models. The last one I was in was a J. Wow. Oh, J. Very nice plane. A lot of the planes, by the way, as you may know, were made right here in San Diego. You know, like 6,000. And some of them, they, gals had written, most of them were women, had written Good Luck Boys or, you know, all kinds of stuff. Oh, really? Nice to see that, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh-huh. Uh -huh, cool. Um, so, sticking with the, the, the crew position, well, did you have another job? Because I, I read somewhere that sometimes the the guy in the nose gunner was also trained as sort of a, 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 a secondary flight engineer. No, our flight engineer, if he had to, would go to the top turret gun, but there was a guy up there. Yeah. I mean, he spent his time with the pilot, which was very important in a couple of missions. Okay. okay. He stood there, back of the pilot. Okay. No, it was just... That's all right. I read, I read a lot of different things, and I'm sure... Sure. Well, with the thousands of guys that went over there... Sure. I mean, I read they made 18,000 B-24s, most produced bomber in history. Um, so were you, I mean, why were you selected for the nose of the airplane? I have no idea. Who selected you there? Well, when I finished gunnery, they sent me to, to uh, Westover Field, Massachusetts, and uh, there we made our bomb, met our bomb crew. Who, who decided who was going to be what? I don't have any idea. But they said, you're going to be a nose gunner. And uh, told every guy where he was going to be. And I met the pilot, of course, and navigator, and uh, bombardier. Remember their names? Yeah, the, the, the uh, pilot was Griffith, George Griffith from uh, Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Co-pilot? Co-pilot. Well... I just remember the guy we started with, his name was Carmen Grasso, and he was from the east, but I don't remember where. Navigator? Was the, was the bombardier an officer? Yes. Mm -hmm. And now, relative, relative to him and the aircraft, where did you sit? 
Well, he was, he was just behind me a little ways. I had to go on th into the plane through the nose, uh, next to the nose, uh, bat, nose tire. Yeah, okay, nose oil. It was very, very bad. If I'd have had to get out of that plane, you know, parachute, I never could have. Yeah, yeah. And uh, best I can tell you on that. So you get up to, you what? went to Westover, that's where they formed yes. the crew. Yes, uh-huh. Now, then was there training uh, as a crew in, at Westover? There was some, but mainly it was what they called uh, slow flight, excuse me, where they were putting hours on the engine, engines, and, uh, and most of those flights, not all of them, but most of them I didn't have to go. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So was there any crew training with, you know, shooting the guns out of the airplane? Well, what, what, when I did shoot out of the airplane mainly was uh, when we were in gunnery school. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't do it out of the airplane, but I did do it uh, up in the air. I guess I did. Jesus, it's been so darn long ago. <laughs> uh, then we would shoot at, 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 at toes being, you know, toes, uh, big things yeah, we'd yeah, shot yeah. at. Right. And uh, I never would have been a pilot for anything. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they got shot down. Uh. I was told to lead, you know. <laughs> they <laughs> lived too far, you know. <laughs> that was not good. But it was important. Well, that's interesting. And we did air to ground, big thing in the ground, on the water, trying to hit that. Really? Mm -hmm. What for, I wonder? I don't know. Thought it might have been gr guns on the ground that we were shooting at. You did know, you ever do combat. that? Did you actually do that in combat ever? No, we didn't have to do that. It could have happened. Okay, so you form up as a crew, you fly together a few times, mm -hmm. then what? Where did you go from there? Well, first we went to Grenier Field, New Hampshire, where we did, uh, picked up stuff that we needed, you know, for combat. Then we went to Iceland, stayed overnight, and then went to Labrador and stayed overnight. It could have been one way or the other, I don't remember which island was first. And on a little aside that it's interesting was that Marlena Dietrich was flying the same route we were to go over and entertain the guys in, oh, yeah. in Europe. And I got to dance with her at both stops. She was at both stops. <laughs> she smoked the whole time and I thought she was going to burn my ears. <laughs> well, you, got to dance, you got to dance with her? Yeah. And, and like I say, she, she was a chain smoker. <laughs> Maybe you so, better don't publish that, okay? Oh, who cares? So what? So when did you, uh, do you remember when you left for England? So hard to remember. Uh, it was during 44, but I don't remember. Springtime? Summertime? See any icebergs? Well, just at Iceland, no. Uh, but other than that, no, the weather seemed, oh, it must have been spring. Yeah, maybe late spring. But sometimes when you fly across the North Atlantic in the spring, you see icebergs all over. They're pretty hard to miss. Isn't yeah, it? that was called the North Atlantic route, and then they had another one that went south. Yeah. Take it over. You know that. Yeah. Were you flying a brand new airplane? Did I what? Was it a brand new airplane? No, uh, we did get some that were brand almost new. You know, they had to fly them around here or wherever they were made, and make sure they were okay. Yeah. And then, um, so now you went over with your crew. Were there maintenance guys with you, or just uh, the ten guys or so in the crew? No, just us. Were you in formation with other airplanes? Were there other airplanes flying with you at the same no. time? So now, what base did you arrive at? Well, it was called Bungay, and it was in uh, area about forty miles from uh, Norwich. And, this, and spell the name again. N O R W I C H. No, I mean the base. Well, there was a little town of Bungay. I don't remember any other name. Did you, uh, did you, have you ever been back? No. No, really? 
So now, the guys that we were with, um, would you, did you maintain friendships with any of them? There yes. Not all of them, but, but the ones that I could make friends with. Uh, I would see the radio operator regularly because I was with a company that's based in, uh, in uh, New Jersey, and uh, he, he lived in that area, so I'd go see him every time, you know, and that was fun. We should have asked this before, but what did you do after the war? Well, we got to get, that's what I was talking about, after the war. I mean, what, is, what was your profession? What was his position? Your profession. What did you oh, do? Oh, I was a pharmaceutical rep. I was with a pharmaceutical company that was based in New Jersey. Oh, really? Which Summit, one? Summit, New Jersey. Oh, which, which pharmaceutical company? It was, at that time, it was called SEBA, Chemical Industries of Basel. Okay. Now it's called Novartis. They merged, oh, yeah. with, merged with a lot of other companies. And when, so when did you finish? When were you done? All together? Yeah. I mean, done with the, the mission in Europe. Was the war over yet? No, the war was still on. In fact, we had to come up back in a uh, ship. You know, we couldn't fly our plane back. Right. And we didn't like that. Yeah. Being on a ship. Did you fly the same airplane the whole time? No. But I mean, our plane, the last one that we flew mostly, we would have been able. And did they did fly them, you know, as soon as the war ended. Yeah. Well, was there. So. But you didn't fly the same airplane all the time. That's interesting. No. No, we did not. Because. We got. In the very beginning, uh, we've had one we called Sugar Baby. And our. Uh, was there nose art on it? Our, our ball turret gunner was an artist. He had been with the company that did cartoons and all kinds of stuff. Well, there's a great picture right there. Yeah, I, I wanted to show you that. I'll take a picture of that thing. Okay. Was that the particular airplane you flew by any chance? Or? Exactly like the one I flew. This happens to be a J model. I don't think you could tell the difference in the models too much, except in the beginning. I think one of the guns was missing in the first one they flew. But, uh, see, I sat out here in front of where the pilots were here, and I was here. Now, I did, when we made lead, I did go back to this waist gun. Sometimes it'd be a right side, and sometimes a other, other gun. Of course, you can't see the ball turret because it's up in here. We didn't put it down until we, you know, went to the enemy coast. And that's our exact markings. Everyone had a different marking on yeah. the tail, you know. And we were in uh, 446 Bob Group, and, and the diff, diff, each they had a bunch of squadrons in the Bob Group, of course. Five of them. You, gotta, you, you said one of your crew members was an artist. Yes. I, I, and I knew the outfit, and I can't think of it. I think it's the one that did uh, Bugs Bunny, but I can't think of the name oh, of the company. Oh, Warner's. Warner, uh, Warner Brothers, I no, think. No, it wasn't them. But it was a big outfit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he was really an artist boy. Well, you know, Disney, Disney did over 3,000 uh, patches for, you know, different people. So, at any rate. I didn't know there were that many. Oh, God. And well, out, well, for all the different units in, the, in World War II. I didn't know. They, they hired five people. Wow. That, yeah, I just heard this yesterday. They had five people did nothing but draw squadron and wing designs, you know, for... And, wow. Well, well, you know, it was a big effort, you know. Yeah. So... I'm, I'm looking sad because I... My, the jacket they gave us when we went in, you've seen them, a nice, beautiful jacket. And uh, we yeah. did wear them at low altitude uh, for a while. But anyway, um, I had all my missions painted on the back by him, you know, with a picture of the plane. Oh, no kidding. And, yeah. And we, when he moved down here, some bastard stole it. Oh, no. I didn't miss it until, I don't know, I just asked my wife where the jacket was one day and somebody had taken it. I was watching uh, the Antiques Roadshow on PBS last night. I watched night, that occasionally. And they had an A4 jacket, and it was uh, a major who was doing something in Normandy. Had a bunch of, they said it was worth like $3,000. Can you imagine what yours well, would be mine worth? Was, I know mine was worth a ton of money at the, because it had the, everything on it. If, even the ones that didn't have anything on it were de in demand because they haven't made one exactly alike since. Yeah, yeah. They made one they call them Air Force jackets, but they're not. Okay. <laughs> So, how many missions were required 
at the time that you were? At the were... time it was 35. At, once, at one time it was 50 missions. Oh, wow. The chance of coming back was really bad. They lost a ton of planes. So now, do you remember? No, okay, so you, well, you get over there with your crew, and now you flew some practice missions first, right? No, yeah, just a few. But was it not, I mean, because you had to get into those big... You mean actual practice? You mean during a combat or...? Well, prior to going into combat, you flew some practice missions, I believe, to go up and fly with it, when to get into the big box. I don't it, think I went on those. Oh. I don't, I don't, you know, some, the, the officers went on some of them, you know, uh, when they just had to do slow time on the new engines or stuff like that, they'd go up, but uh, we didn't go up in very many. So what was your... Oh, okay, now you lived in uh, Nissan, Nissan Huts, mm -hmm. or did they call them Nissan Huts then or Quonset Huts? You know, I don't remember. Yeah, okay. I've heard that they I call them I think they both. probably had both. Yeah, well, Nissan, Nissan was a guy who lived up in uh, Canada. He was a Canadian real Canadian. I didn't even know officer. that. Um, so, do you remember the date of your first actual combat mission? I don't remember, but I had it. And I don't know where it is. I have it all on a sheet of paper. Wait a minute. No. This one over here is a mission where we flew a low altitude mission. We got, uh, you know, a lot of BS on, from it. <laughs> here, well, how many missions did you actually end up with? 30, because okay. we became lead crew and, and we found out why it was less, because they knew we were we carried a bomb site. The lead and the deputy lead carried a bomb site. Right. So as soon as a few of those were shot down, they knew what the story was. Even though the guys, I mean, they'd find the bomb site. They didn't have to ask them. Oh yeah, the navigators were supposed to shoot it with a 45 and put it out of commission, but actually the Germans already had the plans, and they had a better bomb site already. Better bomb site than the Norden? Yeah. A friend of mine. Never wrote, heard of that. A friend of mine wrote. I, I have a friend who who's about your age, and he he uh, used the Norden bomb site in Korea, and uh, he wrote an article called something like Norden bomb site hit or myth, because it wasn't very good. <laughs> At, when we first flew, there was a guy with a 45 and escorted us out to the plane. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So BS. <laughs> Okay, so it, typical wake-up time before a mission. Usually, at least by five. Okay, and yeah. then have breakfast. Yeah. Just the enlisted guys together, right? Yeah, the officers had their own mess. Okay, and then when did you first see the officers? You mean you're speaking now when we started flying our, our missions? Yeah. So. Oh, uh, we saw them when we got to the plane. Okay, and then. Were you, and you had some duties to pre-flight your, your position, I guess. Well, we were lucky because by the time we flew, we had it, one guy was an armorer, on the, you know, that was his job to do, and he didn't have to do it because he had armorers checking out all the guns and everything before okay. we got into the plane. Do you remember how many rounds of ammunition you had? They had a, a box on the side of the plane and these belts of ammunition came out of it. I can't remember anymore how many there were, but there were quite a few. Did you ever run out? No. We Did were they? Lucky. We were lucky. Guns ever jam? Ever jump? Ever jam? No, I never had that problem. Hmm. Wow. So you meet your crew at the airplane, and then average takeoff time seven to eight o'clock, something like that. Yeah, it was early. And what what was the longest mission you ever flew? Berlin. Oh really? See, seventeens couldn't go that far. Yeah, yeah. Did you, and you had fighter cover all the way then, right? Mm -hmm. By that time, yeah. So, did you have uh, cover on every mission you flew? Fighter cover. I don't remember seeing too many uh, fighters in our first few missions, but. Uh, I would say after the first couple of missions where they'd fly, fly alongside and we'd wave at them, they'd wave back, you know. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those were P-51s. Okay. Now, 47s fell, uh, flew ground cover for us, P-47s. Oh, they did? Yeah. Uh-huh. And those 51s were at altitude. 
So when you hit Berlin, it wasn't a direct flight. Sometimes you went up around the North Sea and the Baltic and all that came down that I, way. I can't tell you the, the, the navigation, how they did it. But one thing, I, I, I said Berlin, but it was actually, it was called the German Gehring, Hermann Gehring Synthetic Oil Works. And it was just south of there. Oh, well, I know why. Because we were supposed to go to Berlin, and the weather was kind of crappy for holding formation, so that was our secondary. And they said, you won't have to worry about flat there. It was the worst we ever had. Really? Yeah, we got shot up so bad that uh, uh, I'll go into that later, because you want to know about when well, we Well, let's, let's talk about it right now. So well, you're, you're sitting in the airplane. You're looking at the front of the airplane. You get the best view in the whole airplane, yeah. probably. What's it like? Well, to me, I, what I remember is being sad. We're buddies of mine, maybe I bunked with the night before, and a plane we exploded or was or shot down. And sometimes they would shoot engines out. And uh, that was an advantage of having more fighters in the latter part of the war, that we could, you know, they'd have some cover. But we couldn't, if there was one, two engines out, we couldn't make it back over the channel. Seventeens could. Right. But they couldn't go so far and they couldn't carry as many bombs, so that's why they weren't, uh, they didn't have a lot of 17s. They had some in England, and they got the glory because if you were a, uh, how should I word this, if you were a reporter, you wouldn't want to go to the Pacific and sleep in the sand, you could sleep in a hotel room in a nice bunk. You know, nice <laughs> bed, right? So the 17s got tremendous amount of stuff. Of, yeah. of, uh, Things. Well, you guys said Jimmy Stewart, though. Come on. Jimmy Stewart was a mile from me. Oh, really? I met him once. He was 445th, we were 446th, and he had a buddy in the 446th. One day, he, he met his buddy, he wasn't in my barracks, and, uh, or my Nissan hut, or whatever it was. But he, he just, he's such a nice guy, he wandered around, he came in our and our, on our front, in our front door, and everybody said, Ted, shut up! And all oh, get back, sit down, you guys. But we didn't have much time with him, but he did say hi and shook hands with us. But in the first barracks where he stopped, boy, he was telling him which... <laughs> I don't quote me on that. I I'll, didn't quote on that, did it? No, it did, but I'll take it out. Oh, no please. <laughs> so, he, he was in 24s, you know. Yeah, I know. Did he, he ended up being a lieutenant colonel. I know that. Yeah, he uh, he was so smart that he, I think he had a chance to fly about 12 or 14 missions. That's about all he flew. Really? And then he went up the first step, it was, uh, I don't know, a squadron, a squadron, and then droop, and then on up. Yeah, you know, yeah, clear yeah. Up. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting to have a personal contact like that with him. Yeah. So you get to the airplane, crew gets on board. Start engine, they fire a flare or something like that, everybody starts and taxis out? No, don't fly. We flew flares, but not, not for flying. Uh, I think, again, yeah, if you had a problem, there was a red flare. Yeah. And I don't remember all the different flares. There were more than there was a green one, but I don't remember that. So, okay, now you're approaching, you know you're approaching flak. So, what do you do? Just cross your fingers and hope? Well, mainly, you try to, you, you, as you know from many flights, you can't deviate on the bomb run. Right. But before you get there, you can do some deviation right. from the flak. Right. And but you got a whole bunch of planes all turning. Out. What a mess. Well, you would follow the lead. I mean, when we weren't lead, we'd follow a lead ship. Right. If they went this way, we went that way, and vice versa. And, uh, but when you have to go on the bomb round, they know where, where the hell we're going to be, and you know, you just can't do a damn thing about it. What would, do you remember the speed that you were flying at when they dropped the bombs? I wish I do. I, I just don't know. It's probably slowed down though, right? I, I didn't know that we did that. I don't remember that. Yeah, okay. Now, when I was in nose turret, just as an aside, as an aside um, <clears throat> before we made lead, I would watch the lead shoot, lead plane in front of us, and when he dropped his bombs, there was a smoke bomb. And when when I got to the smoke bomb, I had a toggle switch, and I went like that, and the plane went like that. You know, our, so if the guy was good, the lead bombardier, we got a great pattern. A sw what did the switch do? 
it, it lets the bomb the, the bombardier or whoever the hell did it uh, open the doors before we got there. Right. And it just salvoed all the bombs. That's why I say tremendous pattern if that lead bombardier was good. Right. And when we were lead crew, we had a lead bombardier, so I didn't have to. I didn't do the toggle switch. That I was called a toggleer. <laughs> yeah. So so in other words, if you were if you weren't lead, you were dropping off the guy in front of you, mm -hmm. and as soon as he dropped, then you'd hit a switch and boom. Oh, well, when I got the smoke bomb. Yeah, right. A little bit of a few minutes. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Would you, and I suppose you were in a position where you could actually see bombs impacting the ground from other airplanes sometimes, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah, and you could see a lot of plaque ahead of you from like, the other guys, yeah. you know, for the other, whatever. So did your airplane get hit by flak ever? A lot. And but I understand it sounded like hail on a tin roof, and it's just what it sounded like. But did it disable the airplane at all? Well, the first time that was bad, uh, we were able to uh, I would call it a controlled crash in France. And what really? We were down to down to two two. Oh yeah, you can't fly it. B-24 with two engines loaded up, like, you know, with people and stuff. And uh, so the pilot says, well, uh, start looking for a good spot. <laughs> and uh, so we all participated in that. And uh, So where did you land in France? I can't tell you the first time, but the second time was near Nancy, France, and the people were so wonderful. I'll never, ever forget how nice they were to us, because the Germans had been there for almost five years, yeah. and they hated them like a passion. Oh God! When they say up, saw us, they give us champagne. They, champagne. They kissed everybody, and they were so glad to see us. So did so you you crashed twice in France. Yeah, the second time was really bad, and and uh, what happened was that they one of the flak shells or whatever uh, disabled our the. Uh, Just a minute. Disabled the hydraulics. They couldn't get the Bombay door shut. Oh, and the, the shell had gone through between number one and number two engine and didn't explode. It left a hole that big. So all that gas was coming through, and I was in the waste at that time. We were all completely soaked with gasoline. So I thank God every night, all these years, for not killing, not us not exploding, because there was gravel and everything in this place where we landed. And you know, there's sparks. Oh, yeah. If you ever watch the plane land, there's always sparks anyway, if on a runway, even. Yeah, oh, sure. And we didn't explode. So, but then, but then even after you crash landed, but then you went back to England to fly more missions. Well, uh, yeah, both times. How did and, you get back there? Uh, well, they picked us up. I mean, you know, we. I don't know how the hell we, uh, I mean, probably the guys that made it back told them back there that whatever plane was uh, had gone down. So then they call whoever it was in, in this, in the second, I don't remember the first, how they notified them, and the second one they called Paris, and they sent a big truck <laughs> and picked us up and took us to Paris, which is really neat for young guys, you know. Uh, because uh, liberated Paris, American. Oh yeah. Oh. Where were you, Papa? Holly's Bashir, Ohio. <laughs> but anyway, it was a lot of fun because uh, the interesting thing was the English women, no fault of their own, but you know the uh, the stuff that we used to make a lot of war material uh, takes uh, like cosmetics. Mm -hmm. The women over there did not look great in England, but France, you know, they'd have these German guys in there, and they had cosmetics that the women looked terrific. Now the ones that they knew did that, they shaved all their heads. You probably heard about After that. The war, they yeah. marched them down the, oh, that's the right. main street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, well, your whole so. Your whole time of actual combat, how many months was it over? I wish I had, I still have that sheet of paper. I don't know where it is, but it, it showed how much time for every mission. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, when, let's put it this way. When did you come back to the States? Winter time? Uh, 
it seems to me, no, I, I think it was it was still summer or summery because I can't remember. Okay, so so let's talk. We talked about the flak. Now, when the flak happened, the fighters the fighters got out of there. They went and waited for you someplace else, I suppose. No, they didn't have to go far away. No, they didn't. But I mean, they didn't want to get in the flak. No. So, uh, no. so now the flak run probably was about 10 or 15 minutes at a time, you suppose? Mm -hmm. 15 sometimes. Uh, the fighters, uh, you know, the flak was very easy to see from, from a distance. Sure. And so the fighters far ahead, they could get out of that, yeah. fly above or below, or not below us, but, but yeah, they could be below us also. Yeah. So when was the first time you saw a German fighter? Our last two missions. It took that long? Yeah, and when we got back we, at briefing we reported that we, were, had, we had rockets go through our formation. And this guy says, oh those were jets. We said, what are jets? Nobody warned us that it could be happening. Well, we didn't think they had the gas to fly them, so we didn't even talk about it to you guys. Yeah. They knew about it. They knew yeah. that they had the, the fighters, ME-262s. So yeah. now when the, when the jets did attack, or fighters, whatever, they came at you from the front? At 12 o'clock high, and they, they didn't hit us, thank God. They hit a couple of them in our, in our uh, formation, in our squadron, but uh, I don't remember how bad. can't remember that. So now, I was reading something in that, I, was, I read this book called uh, Big Week, you know, which was late February of 44. They talked about four or five different guys that they, you know, guys like you, where they just sat down and talked, and they mm -hmm. talked about what, what happened. And they talked quite a bit about uh, Jimmy Stewart, too. Um, he probably wrote a book about it, maybe that's why. Yeah. But anyway, they talked about how the, the German fighters, one of the tactics, according to the German, was parallel the formation of mm -hmm. bombers. Get out, I think they said three miles ahead, and then turn back towards you to come straight on at you. Okay. And they said that they wanted them to fire at about 900 yards. Uh, and the closure rate, if you're doing 200 and they're oh. doing 300, is about 900 feet a second. Could be. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have a lot of time. Maybe three seconds or so from the time. That's right. That's right. So what did you do? I mean, did you actually take shots? Nothing. At <laughs> no, did you? Well, we, no, we couldn't get shots at the jets. No. How about the other fighters, ME-109s or things like that? I mean, I know you, I know you fired the guns, so. Yeah, I only, I only fired, fired it once, other than clearing the guns when we went, the pilot would say, okay, when we're over the channel, we'd make sure the guns were working, you know. Yeah. But other than that, I had a shot. Uh, <clears throat> As we were going down, uh, it is, I don't know what altitude we flew, but we went down then to fly that low altitude thing. And uh, I saw one German fighter, ME 109, uh, shooting at a plane right below us. You know, not, not, not close to us, but I mean, close enough to see, I can see him. <laughs> and I don't remember the plane was, was shot down or what, airplane, I don't know. But you took shots at the ME-109? I got some, a few shots off, yeah. <laughs> did, he hit, did you hit anybody or do you have any idea? No, I don't think so. How about when you were a waste gunner? Did you, did you see any, did you see any other opponent, uh, uh, any German fighters when you were a waste gunner? Mm -hmm. Well, you must have been fairly, fairly later in the war after they cleared the skies of those guys pretty well. You mean the, of the German fighters? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was later on. Uh, although they would fly on a, on a day, uh, how can I say this? Let's say they're going to hit a big target. They're out of ways. And they look for for uh, ones that are got engine engine or engines out, and yeah. they, they they just go they, after them. They know? pounce on the, the yeah you know, the ones that weren't better mm -hmm. injured yeah right. Oh boy, so how did you dress for a mission? Well, in the beginning, your head take your elbow away. You may be able to show. After three missions, we started using electric flying suits. You plug them in yeah. at your station. How'd that work? 
pretty good except one time I had uh, on my right boot I had a couple of or maybe the whole thing and I got my toes frostbitten and that's one of the reasons I moved to California. Oh yeah? <laughs> I got sick of that every winter, a <laughs> damn cold. <laughs> <laughs> So now you wore oxygen mask because you were at high altitude. At ten, it, I was the guy that was supposed to tell everybody it's 10,000 feet. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So, and then you put on oxygen mask. And now, how could, was, the mag, was the microphone inside the mask or were they using those stupid throat mics? Mm -hmm. That's the way I remember it float. The throat mic? Yeah. Well, what did that sound like anyway? Weird. Yeah. But I mean, could you tell who was talking? Yeah, usually. And there was a lot of conversation, right? They don't want a lot of it. Uh, only if you had something very important to say. Yeah. Like, uh, you see a oil coming out underneath the wing or whatever, you know. Well, or, or in fighter context too, I suppose, right? Yeah. So how many different airplanes did you actually fly, B-24s? I mean, when you were over there? Well, that's a good question. As I said in the beginning, and I don't know why this happened this way, but before we became lead, we had our own plane for about six or eight missions, and uh, it just didn't last. I don't know whether it wasn't, I mean, if it was shot down, it wasn't when we were in it, you know. But I had a picture of that, and I don't know where that is anymore. So when the, when the, uh so the airplanes that you crash landed in, um, I heard it never flew again the second time. Well, the one I, that we, yeah. Well, it was all shot up, and we were so lucky; not a one of us got scratched. Wow. So all, all so there were ten crew members. All ten crew members went, and all two cameras came home on a boat. <laughs> yeah, God, we hated that. And the second day out, we had a submarine scare. And those poor infantrymen, infantrymen were just dying because they couldn't do a pox hole in the decking, you know. Just about, I mean, just, they went wild. So, okay, now, so, so you were coming home when the infantry guys were coming home, too. Yeah. So the war must have been really wrapping up. It must have been getting Well, close. yeah, they did rotate, though, you know, towards the end. When they got enough guys over there, they didn't have, have a have to have as many infantrymen or other engineers or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. I would say the last three or four months. Do you recall if the Battle of, of the Bulge had occurred by then? By the time you left? No, it, when, we were, when we were still flying, the Battle of the Bulge was going on. Okay, so that was, that was dead of winter. We flew around, you know, drop bombs and the... I mean, we were told where the bombs were supposed to go, you know, where there were still Germans. Right. So we wouldn't hit our guys, you know. Well, that was a low-level mission then. I mean, you were down. No, it wasn't. Still at high altitude. Yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't low-level. Well, there must have been some of the P-47s must have been around then too. Yeah, remember we had we we also had uh, we were called heavy bombers, and then we had the uh, medium or light bombers, and those were the 25s and 26s. Yeah. And, right. uh, you know, there were a hell of a lot of those planes flying out of the Ninth Air Force, which is in yeah. based in... Uh, yeah, I, one of the guys I talked to, a um, school teacher up in uh, uh, Ramona, uh, P-47 uh, pilot, and he said that, that they were so good at dropping bombs, they could flip a tank upside down. They'd come in low level and drop a bomb, hit right in the tank and blow it up and flip it over. I know, I heard those stories too. Well, that's what he said. I think it was a lot of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was just up this, this, this high from the damn stack or whatever. Well, they were right down, and that was the problem. He was down low and they, and they had a flight of four. Oh, and they yeah. all went on target, one, two, three, four, and he was number four. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, by that time, they figured out where to shoot and they yeah. shot him down. Yeah. He uh, spent six, seven months as a prisoner of war, came home. Uh, he had a twin brother, and they both were interviewed at the same time. They didn't let them go together, though, did they? No, but they both flew P-47s. I'll be damned. But what was interesting, the brother went to uh, went to uh, Africa and Italy, uh -huh. and uh, he said that it was interesting. They the interviewer interviewed him one once at a, one at a time, uh -huh. and they said, if we can only take one of you, which one should we take? And they both gave the same answer. 
Take my brother, he's smarter than I am. That's <laughs> <laughs> That was a good one. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, I can't think of it. Uh, so, when you went to the airplane, were you aware what their mission was going to go? Did they, yes. That, that's when the, t the pilot they had, system... They had an officer uh, briefing and, and us separate. Okay, so but the, oh, so you had a briefing too of your yeah. own, mm -hmm. and would they pull the curtain you know, back? Officers were regarded quite highly, and that's, they always were separate. Yeah, them. yeah. Well, they did they do the same like doing TV or they or movies where they pull the curtain back and here they are. Really? Yeah. Just like that, and everybody goes oh, It's no. usually ground officers that did it. But you've never been back to England. Well, I was once, yeah. I didn't go back to where the base was. They said it was nothing there except a chicken coop. <laughs> yeah. Was it, could you move around in the airplane very much or were you just stuck in the front? Well, I remember a couple times that I had to go from rear to front and we had an oxygen bottle. You've heard those or mm -hmm. seen them. Sure. And about that high. And, and uh, here's how wide the, the, the step was, you know, the beam to go on. So you didn't dare fall, or you go right through these aluminum bombay door uh, bombay doors, and uh, so none of us ever fell through. <laughs> but uh, I didn't enjoy. It. I had to do it a couple times, and I don't remember why, but I didn't enjoy it. How did you relieve yourself up there? Uh, we had a relief tube on each side, in in the waist. Now I'm talking about, and in the front, I don't remember. When I was in the front. Now, it was not, I mean, you didn't have any water or anything like that on board because it would have frozen, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you must have got thirsty as hell towards the end of the mission. I don't remember. I just don't remember that. So what was the, I mean, if you can imagine, you know, closing your eyes and imagine, what was that, I mean, your heart must have been going 200 miles an hour when you were flying into the flag, but... When you finally see the English Channel and then finally see the base. <laughs> at that time, at one point in the war, early on, they said that the chance to make it all the missions was like 17%. Oh, it's just terrible. It's like I said, oh, so many of them were shot down. Oh, God, the Luftwaffe was strong, you know. And, and uh... Well, I read a book by the Luftwaffe people. I read some of that stuff, too. And they were saying that the, uh, this was more towards the end of the war, that there were just so many bombers and so few fighters. You know, they just didn't have a chance. They were right. flying three or four times. We guys get shot down three and four times, you know. I think one guy got shot down three times before lunch. Is that <laughs> before lunch? <laughs> oh, bullshit. <laughs> uh, I do know this, though, that the guys that went to the Scarlet Louf uh, the flying guys were treated a lot better than the ground people. Did you know that? The other, they weren't treated nice at all, the ground guys. But the, they always admired, or I don't know what their word is, uh, the guys that flew. They, they regarded them, oh, by the way. You know why? No. Because Garion was a pilot. Oh, okay. Gator Garion was a pilot. Okay. And um, the guys that were... Uh, I've interviewed people who were interviewed by a guy named Hans Scharf. Hans Scharf was the master interrogator for the uh, uh, fighter pilots. And when they went into his office, he sat them down, had a cup of coffee. Oh, I know. We, we were told how nice they'd treat us. Oh, sure. Uh, but what I was going to say is, uh, enlisted guys, and of course I wasn't enlisted, but I had stripes, you had to be a staff sergeant. To fly over Germany. Oh yeah, staff sergeant or higher. They admired rank. Did you? Were you given um, uh, pictures to make phony documents in case you were shot down? Yes, you were. Mm -hmm. uh, P O R P -O, P O W thing. It was about that high and this like this. And also they had uh, money from. Uh, Germany and France. And right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What, it, it, and funny. a picture in, you know, civilian clothes. Regular clothes. Yeah. And, 
And of course, one thing that well, the Germans knew is if they see this coat in this particular tie, because who took coats and ties up with them, you know? Mm -hmm. So they'd say, oh, there's the red tie with the stripes. That guy's from such and such a base, and that guy's from, and they could yeah. identify by the phony pictures they yeah. had. And what they told the pilots was, yeah. unless you can prove to me that you're not a spy. Yeah. I know, you say you're Captain so-and-so, how do I know? Well, we were told if we parachuted out, or if you walked away from the plane, try to find a town that has a priest. Go to, or see a church, go to that church, because they'll treat you nicer. I mean, they, they killed a lot of guys that parachuted, you know that? Mm -hmm, I do. Yeah, uh, as the war went on, why farmers were losing their, their sons, let's say, well, if, you, if your whole town has just been blown up, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, you're not going to look very kindly on the people. So, so on we had a, I was stationed in Germany in the 60s, and there was one town we used to drive through where they had what they called the hanging tree. They just hung up eight guys. You know, that was always the story. But now maybe those were Jews. Are you talking about? No, guys? they were. They were. They're crew members. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but where I was actually stationed, uh, it was on the Mosul River, near the Mosul River. And the Patton's army went to the south, and then I think Montgomery's army went to the north. So they kind of went around that area. Mm -hmm. But this was at 66 through 68, and there were still towns that were still... Still what? Still kind of, you could see where there was a lot of bomb damage. Can't find any Nazis over there now. Yeah, you can. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can. You have to be real good at it, I was told. <laughs> well, well, yeah, there's no, you can't, they're not allowed to salute. They're not allowed to give oh. the... No, hell no. no but not. what I mean is this in real life, uh, whatever jobs they're doing, I mean, no, I hated Hitler, you know, if you'd interview him or yeah, get no, to talk to him. When I was over there, I would we'd go out and drink with the Germans, and you know, when you're sitting there, you know, in a small oh, pub someplace, I, and you start drinking, you talk to guys that are a little bit older, like 60 or so. Oh, yeah, I was on the Eastern Front. And one guy, he was a tank commander. They didn't want to be on the Eastern Front either. Well, but they didn't, you know, they, the idea was they weren't fighting the Americans. And this one guy, he said, he said, yeah, I was on the Eastern Front the whole time. And I said, uh, well, you missed out on Paris. He said, no, Paris was great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wondered about that, about the Eastern Front guys. Uh, you know, Hitler, that was, that was the worst mistake he ever made. Sending them into Africa. I mean, into uh, Russia, when when things were going great and everything, terrible mistake. So what I'm thinking is that these Germans, a lot of the, you know, ground crew, they're not so nice usually, and they probably raped a bunch of those women. And I bet those Russians, when they took it back, raped a hell of a lot of women. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the Germans were really afraid. Generally speaking, of the Americans too. Uh, one very famous uh, German uh, pilot was a woman by the name of Hannah Reich. Uh -huh. I've heard about her. Yeah, and, and her family, uh, when the Americans finally you know, came in, her family committed suicide. And in 1973, when she was interviewed, she was probably in her late 60s by that time, she was still a Nazi. She was what? She was still a Nazi. Oh. She hadn't changed. Oh. You know, after losing your whole family and a oh. whole country land. And, and how strange. That's just weird. Well, you think it was kind of warm when you came home. You think it might, so it might, probably might have been springtime. Yeah, I think so. And before D-Day, definitely. Or well, no, well, my, no, you were... My squadron... My squadron led the whole 8th Air Force on D-Day. Oh, is that it right? happened to be number one. Yeah. Oh, wow. Here, hold it back a little further away. But don't let people think that I did it. Well, the idea was you probably went to a reunion someplace or another of your squadron. Yeah, yeah. That's, in fact, our pilot, we used to get together with, with the pilot as often as we could, because I lived in Ohio and he was in Cincinnati. But he bought us these when we went to one of our bomb group. Reunions. There was another B-24 pilot, his name was Rod Braswell. Rod lived up in uh, Vista, and I interviewed him about He's passed away since. Uh, and after the war, he never saw anybody again. Never saw his crew again. They flew all. The, they flew 30 missions, and they were in, in, out of, in some place down in Italy. Mm -hmm. Just never saw anybody again. See, we were close, and that was so amazing to me, because in the infantry, you didn't get close to officers. But we were all buddies. 
because we all protected each other. I, I, that's not the only reason. We just became so we uh, now I, the one guy I didn't like was the engineer, but he, pilot sure loved him because he he helped us when we uh, got shot a few times. You know he could he could fix the gas so it'd go to another tank and but when the one went through the the damn tank, why well, he couldn't do anything about that. Yeah. You know. Hey, and he landed the airplane and everybody survived. I mean, B-24s are supposed to be pretty bad, terrible to land, you know, with uh, And terrible to be shot up bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they said if you want to, if you want to drop a lot of bombs and go a long way, you take a B-24, but if you want to get back, you want to fly the B-17. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure 17 guys said that, and they're right. <laughs> and there's, a, there's another guy in town here, his name is uh, Bob Cardenas. General Cardenas. Oh yeah, I know about him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I sat, I had lunch with him last week. I sat right next to him. I he's still kicking. Yeah, he's ninety-nine. March tenth. I was going to say, I knew he had to be as old as I am, at least. Well, he's hundred. He'll be hundred in, in March. Well regarded. Uh, well regarded. Oh, he's a sharp guy. You're really sharp too. Thank by you. the way, you're very, very Thank sharp. You. Grand. We had 45 for a while, and they took them away. They said because the Germans were saying we were paratroopers, and you just shot them. Used that for an excuse. We had them for probably four or five missions, that's all. We thought we were really big shit, you know, carrying Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I had another guy, uh, Ed Davidson, who I interviewed. He was 96. I interviewed him last summer. And he got shot down on his seventh mission, and his two best buddies from pilot journey were at Luft, uh, the uh, Luftwaffe II, I think, up at Barth, Germany. And they were there when he got there. They all got shot down on their seventh mission. <laughs> <laughs> but he crashed in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, he went down in the ocean. He had told the guys in the back, the gunners, you know, stay with the airplane, stay with the airplane. And they bailed out, put all that heavy gear on. They all went down. But he said, oh, a German seaplane came around and they landed and you know, pointed a gun at him. He said he took his 45 and just went like that, and, you know, dropped it in the ocean. Heck with this. There's no sense fighting with a guy with a machine yeah. gun. Thinking about the those parachutes and 50-pound back, backpacks. How about those guys that lost their lives in the Zyder Z when that big, they call it Operation Martin Gar Market Garden. Market Garden. Oh my God, it's right down. They couldn't, didn't have a way to slick, get them off quickly. And they yeah. drowned. A ton of them, I don't know how many, but all the oh, And there was a very bad glider. The Waco glider was terrible because if, if it hit anything, the front door wouldn't open. I didn't know that. And they were stuck inside. Yeah, the gliders were bad too. Yeah, yeah I, knew, I knew that. Yeah. Well, so you were there, it must have been just prior to D-Day that you came home then. Yeah, because they, they hit it uh, June 6th. Yeah. And uh, so I obviously, I think I was probably home in April or May. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> However, like, they didn't see one German plane. When they went in, they sure did the next day, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, like you say, they were planning on Calais. Mm -hmm. so, and we, that was one of our most brilliant things we ever did. Yeah. You know, so. Too bad we don't have leaders like that today. Of course, we don't have an, we don't have any opposition with an address. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know where to find them these days. I got